Hashem, Baruch Hashem. I'm Stephen Ben Benun with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, those that are watching on live stream uh, on our channel there, you know, I wish I knew the name of our channel on live stream. I don't even know the name of it. Uh, maybe it's just my name. I I'd actually started a paid channel a little while back and never have been able to figure out what I did with it, what I did with the information or anything, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that fixed in the very near future. Uh, anyway, if you turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah, Yeshayahu 66, this is where we're going to actually speak, speak from today. And uh, we'll go down, we're going to start around verse 5. And I think you're going to find this very interesting. Uh, it's very simple. It's very short scripture. And you wouldn't think that it's speaking of a specific person or a group of people, but it is. And uh, I just happened to catch it the other night when I was reading through Isaiah. And uh, so let me read to you here. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Now he's actually speaking of Israel here. I know we, a lot of times we would think it would be the Christians, but the reason why we know it's Israel is because of his next sentence that he speaks here. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, that's, that's, that's Esau. You see, Esau hated Jacob, and everything that we see about Esau is very much prophetic. Because even though, and, and Esau in type, Jacob had to flee because of his brother's hatred towards him for stealing his birthright. Well, he had an honorable reason. And in reality, too, even in this time here, 2,000 years ago, when the Romans actually came in, and uh, destroyed the temple and ousted the Jews from their homeland, it was in, in effect for his name's sake, for the sake of God's name, because they had rejected the Messiah. They had rejected the one who came in God's name. He said in, the, in, in his word in another place to where he chooses to put his name, and that was in Christ. That was in Yeshua himself is where he chose to put his name. So it says here, hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake. Now, of course, brethren, he does it in the plural there. And, uh, and let me just, let's look at this real quick here in Hebrew. Shema Devar Yahuwah, Chachadarim, El Chabahu Omu Echem, Shanai Enechem, uh, okay, so what we have here, let me get, let me find a little spot. Here we go. Achim, right there is where it's at. It's your brethren, and it is in the plural form. And the reason it's in the plural is because Esau's descendants, and this was carried on down through his children. But he says, Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my namesake, have said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. Who's going to be ashamed? The ones that cast you out. A voice, a voice of tumult from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Okay? Before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child who has heard of such a thing, who has seen such a thing. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born in one moment? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Or shall I cause to bring forth thereupon and shut the womb, says thy God? So you see, God is going to bring Israel forth in her birth and he shows you that he's also going to render judgment almost simultaneously at the birth of Israel as a nation, not as a physical nation, but as a spiritual nation. You see, because when Israel was born in 1948, this is, it is biblical fulfillment. God said he'd bring the house of Judah home first. But in reality, what was that? That was just, they were getting together, the, the, the different people, the Rothschilds, etc., to build uh, a Zionist state. But God was using what they did for his glory to bring home the house of Judah. 
But it did not fulfill the scripture here in Isaiah 66, because in Isaiah 66, the ones that hate Israel, he's also going to render judgment. All right? They did it for God's namesake, technically. God used them to be able to scatter Israel because he knew that once they rejected Messiah, he would scatter them in the four corners of the earth. Now, you might ask the question, those of you that maybe have not heard me already speak on this many times in time past, how, what does this got to do with the Vatican? Well, Esau are the Romans. And many times in the scriptures, we've proven who they are. Um, historically, Hadad, the only uh, child that escaped uh, the sword of David, who was one of the royal descendants of Esau, escaped, went into Egypt, was raised by the Egyptian Pharaoh um, as his own son, in fact, just like Moses was. And then when he became of age, he wanted to leave. Um, the king allowed him, but he was kind of perplexed why he would want to leave when he was being raised as a Pharaoh's son. But he goes, he becomes the king of Syria. This is where he bonds in with the Syrians. That's why you see the Syrians part of the conquest of Israel and, um, uh, at the time of 70 a uh, AD. And of course, while this is all happening, um, uh, while this is all happening, there, there is certainly... Um, no doubt there, there is certainly the, the, the situation that God was doing this for the reason in order to be able to bring out the children of Israel. And um, hang on one second here, guys. But, um, but there was nothing, you know, God intended, I mean, this is how the, really, I'm sorry, I got it mixed up here. This is how the relationship got built between the Syrians and the Romans later it was because Hadad went there. And then later they migrated, even from Jewish history, we can find the migration route because they were following their brother. Esau's their brother, so they were watching his, his history as well. Goes into northern Africa and then finally up into Rome. But Obadiah is the prophet that actually really clears it up for us to know who the Romans really are. And of course, the Vatican, being that it is in Rome, is the descendants of uh, Esau. They're the children of Esau. One of the reasons why they always wanted an Italian on the throne of the papacy today was to make sure that one of Esau's descendants are there. And of course, it's changed from periodically from time to time. But now Pope Francis, who is an Italian, his parents were Italians, is on the throne. And so therefore, they have once again another descendant of Esau on the throne in Rome. But anyway, looking at Obadiah, it's a single chapter book, says, Thus says the Lord God concerning Adam, We have heard tidings from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the nations. Arise, let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I will make thee small among the nations. Thou art greatly despised. See? And of course, the Vatican City is... I mean, you have to remember, the Rome, Vatican Rome, its own country, is the inheritor of the descendants of Esau. They're the ones that are going to fulfill it. Not the, not the Roman citizens themselves today, the Italians, we would say. I mean, and you got to keep in mind, many Italians became Christians in the, in the early days that were faithful Christians. But it's also where Mithras was practiced. It's where the, the ancient uh, religion of Mithras, which was mixed into the papal religion, became the state religion. And that's why we have so many of the doctrines today. Uh, that's why you have your Christmas, your Easter, holidays that are celebrated by many Christians that have no idea of the pagan origins of it. It all is from the Mithras religion. And, uh, but not getting into that point right now, but as we read on in here, he says, The pride of thy heart is deceived thee, and thou hast dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, who says in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? All right. Now, this just sets the stage, because we say, you see here, the vision of Obadiah says, Thus saith the Lord, the God... Uh, Lord God concerning Adam. All right, so the whole prophecy of this book is about Adam or Esau, Esau's descendants. All right, we also find in verse six, Esau, Esau, uh, been been pillaged. How are his hidden things sought out? All men of thy confederacy have driven thee to the border. For the men who are who were at peace with thee have deceived thee. Now, let me real quick as we look at that, let's take a look. I'm going to have to use two different Bibles here because I've got my hands holding a lot of pages here at the same time. But I want to take you to Psalm 83. 
because we want to we want to um, we want to bring out these scriptures um, together so you can kind of see how they dovetail in together with one another. In Psalm 83, and I know one of the brothers there, I, I, I'm not able to see the, the, the text in there very well, uh, those that are watching live, uh, because in my mind gets distracted from that, but uh, they were saying the video is lagging, and I apologize. I have no way of knowing how to to fix that. Uh, but, but at any rate, you will be able to watch this message on YouTube um, here in just a little while as well. Psalm 83, keep thou not silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thy enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. That's their leader, okay? They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, let us cut off them from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. All right. Now notice what he says in verse 6 of Obadiah. Esau been pillaged. Or how has Esau been pillaged? How are his hidden things sought out? All the men of thy confederacy have driven thee to the border. So he is confederate. And by the way, if you look to see who the confederacy is with, it says the tabernacles of Edom, which is Esau, the Ishmaelites, Moab, and the Hagarenes. So see, he's confederate with all these different nations, or in this case here in modern times, the descendants of these nations. And it could be the Syrians. It could be uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. You know, I don't know who for, who this all represents, but nonetheless, there is a confederacy there. Now also, the word tumult. See, there was an uproar, a tumult that was done there. Look back in Isaiah 66 again. Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, have said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy. But they shall be ashamed, and a voice of tumult from the city, a voice from the temple. There's an uprising, even from the temple. What they're going to build, and who's going to build that third temple? It's going to be the Vatican. The Vatican itself is going to be the one that actually builds that third temple. And we just did earlier a, a, a video the other day about that, another proof for that, I believe also from Isaiah 66 as well. So they're in Confederate, they're in a tumult. We see it's Edom, it's Esau the entire time. Then we find also in Obadiah that it's Esau. Now let's go further down in Esau, uh, or excuse me, in Obadiah. For thy violence against thy brethren, verse 10, Jacob, shame shall cover thee. See, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob. All right then, right back to Isaiah 66 again. What did he say? Your brethren that hated you. Yeah, he's talking to the Jewish people. Your brethren that hated you. It's the violence against thy brethren. See, Jacob. It's got a violence, and it's Esau that cast you out for my name's sake, have said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be, what? Ashamed. What did he say over here? For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. You see, you see how it's all tying together? Let's read some more about this. And thou shalt be cut off forever on the day that thou didst stand aloof in the day that strangers took captive his substance. Now he's taking you back to the year of 70 AD. And foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Then thou too was one with them. God knows that it's not just, it's not just, uh, Esau and his descendants. God knows that there were the, there were the Syrians, the Assyrians. That he knows that there, all different people were part of this battle that Rome had brought together to ransack Jerusalem. But you forget, it was, Jeru it was Rome that was in control of this country, and it was Rome that was bringing everything down. He said, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, then thou too hast one of them, but thou should not have looked upon the day of thy brother on the day of his misfortune. So it shows the descendants of Esau were there at that time. Now we need to see who, which descendants of his. 
Nor shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah on the day of their destruction, nor shouldst thou have spoken proudly of the day of distress. That clearly identifies the house of Israel has nothing to do with this. See, it's the house of Judah. So that's clearly 70 AD. Again, it's the time frame of the destruction of the house of Judah. And Esau is the one being blamed for that. Now, of course, we know the man that led this revolt was Titus, the Roman general. That's just for the historical side of it. All right, so Titus, the Roman general, was there. And the historians even say that Titus was not altogether involved in the battles. It was the Syrians and so forth that were involved. God noticed, notes that here, too. And he says, you stood aloof. You stood, you stood there and watched it happen. But he says, you're one with them that are doing it. So God still puts the blame on Esau. Now, for thy violence against thy brother. All right, we read that part there, okay? Now, let's go down. Let's, we're in verse 12. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, on the day of his misfortune, nor shouldest thou have re re rejoiced of the children of Judah on the day of their destruction, nor shouldest thou have spoken proudly on the day of distress. See? And back again, go back to Isaiah 66. What did he say there? He says that, he says that when he cast them out for their namesake, have said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy. They figured God would be joyful that they did this. God's not happy. God knew that he's going to bring his word to pass because he said he would scatter Israel for the sins that they would do. But it didn't mean that God was going to be happy about it. And they want God to rejoice. All right, back into Obadiah again. See? Now, he said, um, going into verse 13, Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people the day of their calamity, nor shouldst thou have been among those that looked on their affliction on the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance on the day of their calamity, nor shouldst thou have stood on the crossway to cut those uh, cut off those of his who escaped. And this is another historical document that they went in there and they, they cut the people off, wouldn't allow them. Went down there to, uh, uh, you can go down by the Dead Sea to, to Masada. And the Romans built them a huge ramp up there. They weren't going to let no Jews escape. Kill everybody. God wanted to scatter them, not annihilate them. But again, God is clearly identifying that Esau is the one that is involved in this, and historically we see that it is Esau, all right? And it is Esau is Rome, as you see with the, with the Ark of Titus, who clearly shows the Roman victory over, uh, over Israel. Now, of course, the, the Vatican teaches, they have in the past, I know they're trying to wiggle out of this now in modern times, but they're still against the Jews. They're still against them. You're going to see that in a moment, what God says about it, but... In time past, they've always taught in their theology a replacement theology that the lamp of the menorah was passed from Jew to Gentile. And I wish I had the documentation for you on that. I've looked it up before. I've spoken on it in videos before and given you this, but it's been quite some time since I've done that, and I could not lay my hands on that to be able to show that to you uh, for today. But we have done that in the past. Now, in verse 15, for the, for the day... Um, for the day of the Lord is near upon all nations as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy deeds shall return upon thine own head, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, now by the way, that's modern days. Again, he's identifying the Romans, because who is it? Now it's Papal Rome. We see that the, the, uh, the upper room was given to uh, the Vatican. They were given Mount Zion. And not only did they drink on Mount Zion, but they came and also drank inside the tomb of David, showing that they have all of it. And God identifies them right here again. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Indeed, they shall drink 
and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. So Mount Zion is that holy mountain. And of course, that's where the upper room is. That's where the last uh, supper site is. That's also where the tomb of David is. And that's exactly where the Pope of Rome did the communion service. And they've done it every week since then. Right there on Mount Zion. But God said he's going to have deliverance upon Mount Zion. There shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. See, and what did God say over here in Isaiah 66? We drop down into verse uh, 6, a voice atonement from the city, as we saw in, in Psalm 83, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Now that's, of course, Israel being born as a nation. So we know that the timing of the deliverance and the timing of the judgment that God will judge um, Esau, the same time he's going to deliver Israel. That's according to Isaiah 66, and we can prove it by some other scriptures as well. So let's look at this. Let's continue to read in, in uh, Obadiah, though. Back again, verse 17. But upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their own possession. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken it. And they of the Negev shall occupy the mountain of Esau. And they of the Shifla, the land of Pilishtim. And they shall occupy the field of Ephraim and the, and the field of uh, Shimaron. And Benjamin shall occupy Gilead. And, and this exiled host of the children of Israel were among the Canaanim, as for Zarephat and the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sephirad, shall occupy the cities of the Negev. And li liberators, or uh, actually in the King James, I believe it says uh, saviors, liberators, shall ascend upon Mount Zion, to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's your two witnesses. The two witnesses literally come down and will deliver from Mount Zion. Now, let's real quick go into Ezekiel 35, chapter 35. I want to take you to verse 7. He says, Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it all who come and go. And I will fill its mountain with its slain men, and thy hills, and thy valleys, and all thy watercourse, and they fall that are slain with the sword. Mount Seir, that's the mountain of Esau, by the way. I will make thee perpetual desolation, and, and thy cities shall not have a restoration. And by the way, notice he says, those that come and go. You notice how all the world dignitaries are always coming and going from the Vatican. It's always happening that way. And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries, as showing that Israel will be divided into two, that which they already are technically divided, by the way. It's not to say that they will be. They are. It's just the fact that it's not been made as a public declaration. Uh, or maybe we might say, Daniel would say, the covenant is not confirmed publicly. Uh, that could be used in that regard there. But... Uh, uh, we do have a Palestinian state and we have a state of Israel. So he says, these two nations shall be mine and we will possess it. Though the Lord was there. See, Yeshua was there. God, he's already been there showing you where he was there. Where was he? He was in Jerusalem. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to thy anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. Again, the hatred. What did God say in Isaiah 66? See, your brethren that hated you. God says here, because of, out of thy hatred, according to Ezekiel 35, verse 11, against them, and I will make myself known among them when I shall judge thee. Wow, that's what Obadiah just said. The Obadiah says that he's going to make himself known when they're judged. That's what Isaiah says as well. The same thing. He's going to make 
his self known because what happens? He says, then shall be, uh, sh verse 8, uh, Isaiah 66, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at one moment? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. That's after God is dealing with those that hated Israel, which is Esau. He says, shall I bring the birth and not cause to, to bring forth, says the Lord? Or shall I do, cause to bring forth thereupon and shut the womb, says thy God? No, he's going to make it happen regardless. Wow, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, verse 12, And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me, and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, When the whole earth rejoices, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do to thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So again, you want to know who Mount Seir is? God says it right here. And all Edom, Esau, his descendants, just like it says in Obadiah. All right, so we see that clearly. Now, it gets even better. Look in Isaiah 36, verse 2. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said against you, Aha, the ancient of high places are ours in possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, that you might be a possession to the rest of the nations. Didn't I just tell you recently they're going to make Jerusalem an international city? Okay. A possession of the nations. And you are taken up in the lips of the talkers. Who are the talkers? You know how they're always doing these uh, negotiations, uh, dividing the land, um, always these diplomatic meetings that they have in Rome. Of course, it's funny. They're always, they like to do them in Rome a lot, you know. Washington can't seem to get anything done, but the Pope does. Um, these are the talkers. All right? You're taken up in the lips of the talkers. <laughs> Gosh. All right. Let me back up on my spot here where I left off there. That, um, all right. You're, you're taken up in the lips of the talkers and become the gossip of the people. Now, we're, by the way, in Ezekiel chapter 36. We're fixing to go into verse 4. Therefore, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of, the, of God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and hills and to the watercourse and to the valleys and to the desolate wastes and to the cities and that are forsaken, which have become a prey and a derision to the residue of the nations that are round about. Now before I tell you what he says, let me back up just for a moment with that verse 3. You're taken up in the lip of the talkers and are become the gossip of the people. Do you know what the gossip is? That's everybody trying to figure this all out. They are trying to tell you what they really think is going to happen. What is this thing about the two-state solution? Uh, uh, this is really what the Bible is saying. You, it just becomes a gossip. It's not according to the Word of God. We're, I'm showing you according to God's Word. And of course, they all want to point it out to be some Muslim Mahdi that's going to cause all these problems. Gossip. Just gossip. That has nothing to do with it. Now, they use, uh, now, I will say this, the Vatican does use the Muslim people in order to fight and attack Israel and cause all kind of destabilization and stuff so that they can do what? So that they can overthrow Israel. But then God is going to deliver her. So we don't need gossip. We need what God's Word says. So we're getting past the gossip, and we're showing you that it's Rome, it is the Vatican, that is Esau, clearly defined by Obadiah, that that's Esau. Because he showed you that what? That they stood by while Israel was being, just being thrown out. Not just Israel, by the house of Judah. Specifically, Roman, the Titus general. Roman, excuse me, Titus, the Roman general. I got it backwards there. Titus, the Roman general, was that man that took and caused all this. God said that he was Esau. And then God brings it up into modern days and said they're going to divide the land. They're going to take the two nations and make it themselves. Again, he's applying it to Esau. And in modern days, it's Rome doing it. 
Rome is the one that calls all the shots. God constantly is identifying for you who Esau is in modern times, and it is always pointed to Rome, as, of course, as Esau moved around geographically and then find it ended up in Rome, and for the last 2,000 years, he's been there. And of course, we know Esau got into all kinds of idolatry. So it's, that's why you see the Vatican all kinds of idolatry. That's why they mixed in with the Mithras religion, because Esau was already involved in all of that. It was easy for his descendants to believe that. You know, Paul said, after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So there were true Christians that went up into Rome, no doubt, like Paul did. But then... They ended up killing off the true ones, and they just took what part of Christianity they wanted and mixed it in with the Mithras religion and come up with all kinds of paganism for you to follow. Back down here again, Ezekiel 36, verse 5, Therefore thus says the Lord, um, The Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all Edom, who have appointed my land to themselves for a possession with the joy of all their heart. That's what they said back over here in Isaiah 66. They did this. They cast them out. Your brethren that hated you cast you out for my name's sake because God didn't have to scatter Israel for his name's sake, you know. And it said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. They did it with all the joy of their heart. Now they're appointing the land with all the joy of their heart. <laughs> with disdainful minds to cast it out for a prey, prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and to the hills and the water courses and to the valley, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have suffered the insult of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have lifted up my hand, saying, Surely the nations that are about you, they shall bear their own insult. But, o, but you, O mountain of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel. So God has brought our people home for a reason, and that is to bring forth a nation. He will bring the two witnesses. As we read a little bit ago, I believe there in Ezekiel, where it says that when the whole earth rejoices, this is when God is going to destroy them. And the whole earth rejoices according to Revelation chapter 11 when the two witnesses are killed. This is when the earth will rejoice. This is also the same time that Israel will be birthed as a nation. So we are at the very end of all things. And the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand. And Rome, though, is going to try to manufacture a return of the Lord. They're going to try to make it look like a huge spiritual thing. This internationalizing of Jerusalem is being done to make it look like a city, like a millennial reign, a city for all nations to come together. No doubt, I still believe that there's going to be some kind of war against Israel that's going to cause uh, the shifting of the borders the way they're going to do it. But clearly, I have already seen the remnants all around Jerusalem where they're getting ready to do just exactly that. But God is going to judge Esau. Rome will get her judgment for what she's doing. I can only imagine the chaos and the mischief that will come when the two witnesses have finally arrived on the scene. And of course, then as well, we'll get to hear what the gospel was like in the time when Yeshua was here, when he preached it in its purity, not in the corrupted form that we get now. Now, I don't, when I say that, you have to understand, I believe the New Testament, the words that Jesus spoke to be true. But I also know Paul said that if it could be written in books what he did while he was here, what he said, the earth itself could not contain the books. We just got a little trickle of what he said. I can imagine there's more out there of what he said. Makes me wonder too why the Vatican took the Dead Sea Scrolls and would not release it to the public. I can understand why Israel would, especially knowing that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain things about Yeshua and his life. But the Vatican, supposedly a Christian church, why would they hide it? 
As a good friend Gershon Solomon told me one night, not too long ago, in fact, only about six months ago when we were together, he said if it got out what was written, it would expose the Vatican to be a fake and a false religion. I can believe it. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research on this wonderful Shabbat Live message, Exposing the Vatican. I trust it's been a blessing for those of you as well that have watched.